Welcome to the Wisconsin Podcast. I'm Craig Sauer. On this podcast, we talk Wisconsin things, everything from media, sports, culture, nature, politics, and more. In September 2004, this episode's guest, Matt Bernstein, had a day to remember at Camp Randall Stadium. The big fullback was pressed into service as a tailback due to injuries, carrying the ball 27 times for 123 yards to help lead the Badgers past Penn State in a hard-fought Big Ten matchup. But what was perhaps the most interesting part is that Bernstein, who is Jewish, had just completed the traditional 24-hour fast during Yom Kippur. Coach Rice, like, dude, you're in. And I'm like, Coach, I'm in, man. I'm in a fullback. I'm dying right now. And he's like, no, 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 you're in a halfback. And I was like, I just walked up to Greg Root, who is the backup fullback. And I'm like, yo, Greg, let's, it's our time, dude. Let's do this. In addition to talking about that memorable game, I talked to Bernstein about playing under legendary coach Barry Alvarez, the intensity of the Axe game between Wisconsin and Minnesota, and his thoughts on the 2018 Wisconsin Badgers. These days, Bernstein lives in New York City, but can be heard periodically on sports radio in Wisconsin and on his podcast, The Camp, with Zach Halperin. So you just got back from Israel, so I, I guess I got to ask you about that. I mean, I had a blast. Israel is a special place. I was lucky enough to go see the Technion, which is the Israel Institute of Technology, kind of basically like the MIT of Israel. And when I tell you that those kids are way smarter than me, I mean light years smarter than me. You know, and it's a fascinating culture. Most of those, most of the kids at the school are already in the army. They've been in um, either, you know, not all of them are combat soldiers. Some of them in the Air Force, the Navy. Um, they're in, in intelligence. Like the intelligent people are, you know, the, the, the cream of the crop. But it's, you know, shawarma, which is basically like a gyro and falafel. I ate my face off. I drank as much Gold Star beer as I could possibly find. I brought three of them back. Yeah, so I had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so you've been there before? This is my third time. So, yes, keeps getting better and better. It's drop dead gorgeous there. It's like, you know, if you, it's like if you go to Italy, th- you know, uh, three times, it's, it's beautiful there, too. Um, but it's just uh, there's something about being in like, you know, surrounded by chaos and being in this like beautiful, nice, fun, cool country. It's just something it's something so different. All right, now just to get us talking, I got some uh, quick questions, some quick hit uh, question response here for you. So Camp Randall has turf, and I'm wondering what it was like for you to play on turf uh, when you were playing for the Badgers. Did you like it as a running back, fullback, or did you not like it? Well, are you talking about field turf, or are you talking about like the rug turf? Well, what you played on during your playing days. So for the first, I want to, so I, funny story. Do you remember Lee Evans? Yep. The wide receiver. So when one spring game, Lee Evans jumped up with Johnny Sylvain, who was actually my roommate when I first got out there, um, jumped up for like a jump ball. They both came down tangled and Lee tore his ACL. Granted, it worked out well because Lee went to the NFL and played for forever. But that was on the hard like rug turf. So the funny story is Anthony Davis used to say, hey, Lee, Coach Alvarez changed the turf for you. Um, So it's pretty comical. Uh, but, uh, playing on the hard stuff, I hated it. Every time you went down and you hit your helmet, it was like hitting it on concrete. So that stuff was tough, but there's nothing like playing football at Camp Randall. Like I've been to Michigan, Ohio state, Iowa. There just isn't, and this is what, 10, 13, 14 years ago when the student section was absolutely bananas. Um, so it was just, it, it's super special, but the field turf was like falling on a pillow. So speaking of playing at Camp Randall, uh, what is your favorite thing about UW Badger fandom? What's my favorite thing about UW Badger fandom? I mean, I, I think the fans are so cool. The traditions, you know, like the cursing is hilarious. The slow wave, the fast wave, you know, you can hear that on TV. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's special. And, and my favorite was Barry Alvarez, I think in 03 or 04, wrote a letter saying to all the students, like an email, please don't do that. They're kids in the stadium. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> you can hear it on TV. And I've never heard it so crisp and clear in my life. Um, but I, I think the fans make the game. And I think the tailgate is so special. People are out there early in the morning. The bars open up early. You know, I'm, I was at Wando's probably before they even opened with a Bloody Mary, you know, all set up with uh, what's, what's very different about Wisconsin and New York is the Bloody Marys don't come with any of the fixings. And I hate it. So there's no cheese stick. There's no meat stick. Maybe there's like, a, you know, a, an olive. Like, you know, do better than that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like all the crazy Badger fans. And, and it's diehard football as well. Like, people really care about it. So that's – it's a special. It means a lot. Saturdays for the Badgers, Sundays for the Packers. Better athlete, Jim Leonard or Joe Thomas, two guys that you played with? Oh, you know what? That, that's a great question. I've seen Jimmy Leonard dunk a, a basketball. He is 5'4", five, 5'6". Five, like, the dude can walk under the limbo stick. Um, but, uh, you know, Joe Thomas is like 6'8", six, 6'9", six, whatever he is, almost 300 pounds, and, and he can move. You know, that's a great question. I'm going to go I, – I, I'm going to go with a toss-up, leaning a little bit. I'm going to lean more towards Jimmy because, let's be real, the dude was 5'6", and he played in the NFL for 10 years. You know, so I think it's his brain and his football IQ, but I won't take anything away from Joe Thomas running to his side. Our coach said that guy will make the block every single play. So, you know what you're going to get on his side. He's like on the other side. Good luck. (laughs) (laughs) As a fullback, what did you enjoy more? A monster block that freed up somebody for a touchdown or scoring a touchdown yourself? Oh man, there's nothing like a monster block to have like Anthony Davis or Calhoun score a touchdown, you know, Dwayne Smith, like that to me is cool. Cause that's your job, you know, getting a scoring a touchdown is like super special, but it, it wasn't what I went to Wisconsin to do. I mean, I was very happy to do it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but those monster blocks get to keep you on the field, you know, and uh, I'm not going to lie. Barry co- coach likes when you make a monster block, he likes when his guys, his like favorite guys score touchdowns and Anthony Davis is that guy. So when I made a monster block for that dude to score and he wasn't touched, Coach Alvarez was amped. He was pumped about it. So we've already been talking about Wisconsin food a little bit. <laughs> uh, so I want to know what is your, your favorite Wisconsin culinary treat? Oh my God. My favorite culinary experience at Wisconsin? Oh my gosh. Um... Well, I mean, you, you got to go cheese curds. I mean, that, that is what Wisconsin is known for. You, you can't really get that anywhere. You know, New York's got the mozzarella sticks, but they're just not the same. Um, I was a huge fan back in the day. Mondays, on Mondays, Wando's, because Mondays is a bar also, Wando's had $2 cheeseburgers that we would go and eat an absurd amount of cheeseburgers, and it was delicious. <laughs> Um, and oh, and how can I forget brats? I mean, I, I don't even know. I'm like starving right now to eat a brat. They're so good. And basically anything that's really fattening. That's what I love about Wisconsin. You, you can't even get a salad. <laughs> There's side, you, know, you get a fried fish sandwich and a side of French fries, tater tots, or cheese curds. It's, and then it's a dollar fifty extra to get a side salad. <laughs> it's the best place in the world. It's like heaven. <laughs> So recently, I was having a conversation with somebody who lived in New York for a long time, uh, and we were kind of just talking about how there was this kind of respect or mutual appreciation between uh, people from New York uh, and people from Wisconsin, and you know whether it's from people who are from New York and went to Wisconsin or for uh, vice versa. Um, did you see that kind of appreciation as well? That kind of loving relationship. You know, that's a great question. So I, I yes. There's a great um, relationship. I think a lot of the New Yorkers who went to Wisconsin really like bought into the university, really fell in love with it. Um, I randomly see people with like, you know, businessmen in thousand dollar suits with a Wisconsin hat. 
you know, it's so weird to see that. Um, I, I really do. I think uh, people have like a lot of Badger pride in New York. Um, when you get around Badgers, they're excited to be around each other. Uh, you know, it's the first thing I looked at, look on for LinkedIn. Um, if I'm trying to get in touch with you is if you're a Badger, even though it's, you know, it's few and far between, but um, people really love Wisconsin. Uh, not only that, they're all their friends know that they went there. And it's funny, I was in, I, so I work out at Orange Theory on the Upper West Side. And yesterday I was wearing a Wisconsin sweatshirt and some mom's like, oh, I got two sons there. And we just got into a long conversation about Wisconsin. She's like, I love it there. You know, they're so happy. They're in a fraternity. They're living the dream. She's like, oh, and my uncle went there and I know all these people. And I'm like, well, who? And we have mutual friends. And it's just so, it's so interesting that, that, you know, that community, Wisconsin community in New York. And it's, it's really special. I, I'll tell you, you know, if you see people in Michigan stuff and you want to push them down, but when you see people in the, the red, the red hat and the motion W it's, it's a special. So we got to talk about this uh, Badger season a little bit, the 2018 Badgers. Uh, the, the team kind of started the year ranked fourth. Obviously, they didn't end up there. Um, <laughs> how, how do you judge them based on the expectations uh, versus what actually kind of panned out this year? I, I mean, I was the one who was, gonna, who was saying they're going to go 14-0. and 0. So, you know, I have my expectations for the Badgers were extremely high. Um, and I thought they had a lot of the right pieces in place. I think the coaching staff's phenomenal. I, you know, I, I think at the end, it, it kind of showed that they struggled at, at the quarterback position. And obviously, that's the most important position on the field, minus the fullback. <laughs> and, uh, and it showed. You know, it showed we had great wide receivers. Our running game was spectacular. Our O-line was, was pretty dominant. You know, we just, we just didn't get the, the, the play we kind of needed out of um, – our quarterback position. And, and it definitely hurt us in the long run. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see some of the guys go out a winner at Yankee stadium. Like that was really cool. Uh, you know, guys like Conley and TJ Edwards, these guys really work hard day in and day out. They've been, I've been friends with them for years. It's so it's nice to see that. It's just, uh, I thought we'd be in the playoffs and, you know, for Wisconsin, let's be real. The big 10 schools are, it's not easy to get into the uh, playoff system and, you know, I thought this was our year and you never know. Jack Cohen looked good. And, uh, you know, we got Graham Mertz, who is a, was an all-star at the All-American. He's through five touchdowns, I think. So, you know, things are looking up. Jonathan Taylor staying, I mean, against what I think he should have done. I think he should have went. But, you know, I'm happy he's staying back. And I think Beata just staying the center, I think. So, you know, things are looking up. They're looking good. I'm 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 excited. You know, we lost um, the running back coach. So, uh, you know, I think, I think that hurts. I, I, I really enjoyed being in the meeting room with him. But, you know, you, they recruit guys. It's running back you. It's never going to stop. Like, you can name 100 guys who have played there who have all been fantastic. Um, but, yes, expectations for me were extremely high. To lose the ax kind of cuts like a knife. But, I mean, it <laughs> – I don't think that could have went on forever. It's, it, you know, it had to end at some point, you know, all good things come to an end, but I didn't think it would be this year. You know, I thought it'd be a year when we were really down and we were not that down, but you know, these things happen and uh, we got to look forward to 2019 season. It's right around the corner. That's what's great about football. There's always next season. I'm a Jets fan. We're always next season. You know, we're always got a top five pick. That's the most exciting part of the season. <laughs> Uh, speaking of next year, uh, 14 and no next year. Uh, is that what we're predicting? Oh my God. 14. No, I, I would say probably not 14 and oh, I, I mean, I would love to see us, you know, win our side and go to the big 10 championship. I think with the teams that are the way they split it up, we can, that could happen every year. Um, you know, I think we just, if, if Jack Cohn's the guy or Graham Mertz is the guy, even if Hornibrook, Hornibrook can somehow come back, I, I think we're going to be solid. You know, we, Jonathan Taylor is just uh, the best running back in college football. I mean, so I, I say that because I'm biased, but I also believe it. I mean, the dude cannot be stopped. So, uh, I, you know, I'm, I got high hopes. I got high hopes. 10 and 3, 11 and 2. You know, I think we j just missed the playoffs, but we should be up there. Uh, speaking of Jonathan Taylor, how would you like to block for that guy? You know, I, well, I would love to. The guy makes plays. You know, I, my time with 
with guys like Dwayne Smith and Anthony Davis, you know, those, those guys are special, man. Calhoun, my last year, like it, it, I always want to block for, I want to block for everybody. I wish I could play college football and, until I can't play anymore. But, um, you know, Jonathan Taylor was a special dude. Anthony Davis was a special guy. Dwayne Smith, until he had that heart problem, was a special guy. You know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you, as a fullback, you're lucky to play at Wisconsin because you know you're going to block for some of the best to ever play in college. You know, look at, uh, look at Chad Coons blocked for um, Ron Dane. Like, how special is that? Earlier, we were talking about the X game, the, the the rivalry between Minnesota and Wisconsin. And you played in a number of those games uh, when you were in school. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what it was like for you uh, to play in that, that rivalry game. Oh, man, the X week was the most important week by far. Um, the co- All the coaches were amped up. You know, in 2003, we lost the X there. So that was horrible. You know, you got to you got to trophy case in your in your locker room that doesn't have the axe it just kind of sits there empty as almost like a taunt that like hey you lost it um <laughs> so it's it's really painful um but it's a, it's such a great rivalry you know it's so exciting if you know it look at look at this year minnesota was a terrible team but it, the game only matters that one game is it's just that game you know like it doesn't matter if minnesota's 0 and 10 leading up to it they're going to come as hard as they possibly can. And, and that's what I think is special about it. it. It's pretty solidly, I think it's almost dead even with wins. I think Minnesota had a ton of wins early on in the 1900s. And then we kind of took it back for the last 15 years. But I think we're pretty much even. So that's how special that rivalry is. But it's bananas to play in. Like, it's so much more amped up. It's so much more exciting. You know, there's a lot of uh, Minnesota uh, students at Wisconsin, there's a lot of Minnesota students who are from Wisconsin. So a lot of people come to the games. It's like, it just is that border rivalry X as a trophy is just so cool. You know, everyone now there's a hundred different games with trophies, but nothing is like holding like a six foot X or, you know, it just seems ridiculous, but it's, it's just so cool. You grew up in New York and uh, you played high school football in New York. Uh, and then you come to Wisconsin. How do you kind of get indoctrinated into that rivalry since you don't necessarily uh, have the history of it uh, growing up in the same sense that somebody from Wisconsin or Minnesota uh, has? How, how does that get instilled? That's a great question. I, I think you get indoctrinated, you know, like as a red shirt, like, you know, each week is not the most exciting week just because you're not playing any. All you do is practice. And then you stand on the sidelines and watch a game. So it's really not like super exciting, but before the game, the coaches take, you're in a meeting and they go over the history. You don't go over history of playing Michigan or playing Ohio state playing Purdue. No, there's no history lesson. There's like a 30 minute history lesson of Wisconsin versus Minnesota. And they have pictures and there's, you know, there's all these like, folk tales about guys who cut their fingers off to continue to play all this crazy stories that you just right away. You're like, wow, man, I played for this team that somebody cut his finger off to keep playing. So you kind of pick it up really quickly about how exciting and how important it is. Um, at, at least for me as, as like a, you know, a red shirt freshman from New York, you know, there's a lot of your friends who are from Wisconsin. So they'll, t- they tell you, they're like, listen, this is one of the most important games ever. You know, every year I watch this game, I came to the games. So you kind of get indoctrinated pretty quick. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, and guys who have played in, you know, the act game for five years, I'll tell you something funny in the locker room, there's TVs that, that are set up, you know, so you can watch ESPN or whatever throughout every other week, you could change the channels. You can do whatever you want. You can watch, you know, we used to watch Saved by the bell or whatever you wanted to watch during this week, they have on loop. Games when we won, running around with the axe. They don't play plays in the game. They just play guys running around the stadium with the axe, and that's it, on a loop. So it's like 20 games of guys running around holding the axe up, and it just loops. All day, I went in there. You, you, you'll go in there at like 5 in the morning. It's still up on the screen. So they don't even turn it off. It's just constantly on loop. 
Um, so that you kind of pick it up pretty quick, you know, like the weight training coaches are very serious about how important, it, uh, you know, you, you, you don't mess around. There's no joking around during that week. It's, it's very serious. Uh, so what's it like now watching that, that rivalry game as a, as a fan? You know, I think watching games in general is just kind of tough because you want so much to be out there and, it, and you just remember, it's like, you'll never feel that way again, running out of camp Randall. It's not like getting a promotion. You know, I would maybe probably winning the lottery might be uh, close to it, but there really isn't that feeling, you know, how fired up you are, how excited you are to go play in a game where, you know, people are hitting hard and there's tackling and it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just so exciting. And, you know, that's, that's feeling completely gone now forever, but you know, there's, there's nothing like Badger football. I mean, that's for sure. You got to play under coach Barry Alvarez in the last few years of uh, his coaching career. I'm wondering what it was like uh, to be a player under him. Coach Alvarez is, is such a cool dude. You know, I think you talk about like a football genius. He, he, he's like one of the best generals. He hired fantastic people. You know, he's, he's like the Don in a mafia. He hired all these great cap, capos, you know, to really run the show. And he had a ton of input, but he, was, he allowed the assistant coaches to take over with their guys. And I think that's special. You know, Coach Alvarez would coach you hard. He'd tell you good job when you needed to, but he let his guys coach. And, and you know, I, I thought that was super special. He had your back. Like he knew your parents, you know, there was, it, it, he would joke with you. Like it, it's nice. Um, you know, we had, uh, we had bagels and lots. He came to my house um, when I was being recruited and he didn't eat anything. Like he didn't eat bagels. He didn't eat locks. Uh, I didn't know if he knew what that was. You know, it's like very Jewish cuisine type of stuff. Smoke to have like the, the, the smoke locks. Um, and I was crushing bagels. You know, I, I had, a, it was a full spread <laughs> and I, I was just like, I don't know what to do. And, and my first year, Coach Alvarez, he came up. He's like, he's like, man, he's like, guys, I was at Bernie's house. And everyone called me Bernie. I don't think anyone knew my first name. Actually, Coach White couldn't even spell my name, which is hilarious. But he's like, I was at Bernie's house. He's got bagels and a lox. I don't know what lox is. And I was like, how does he remember this? Like, he probably sits in a thousand people's homes. But that's what was special about him. He knew things about you. You know, he, he was there for you when he needed to be. He was also, you know, like that, that stern schoolmaster if he needed to be also um but but coach white brian white who was the running back coach really was like my mentor at, at school i came in i he would tell you right away like i sucked <laughs> as a freshman as a red shirt i was horrible they asked him a question once and he's like hey they're like hey how's how's matt bernstein doing we haven't talked about him and he's like i don't know <laughs> so so uh it's it's real it's a real interesting kind of dynamic you know, you got to be coach coachable. You got to be able to take, you know, the BS and the MFs lightly. You know, like I never took it. I, I was coached hard in high school. So whenever somebody was, was, was yelling at me pretty hard, I, I kind of laugh. you know, on the inside, you're like, you kind of laugh at it. It's kind of funny. Um, so coach white would tell you I sucked. And then, you know, in the off season, all I did was go with him and watch film. I, I would probably sit in a room and watch the same play 30, 40, 50 times over and over rewind, same play, rewind, rewind, next play. It's a, and it was 25, Bob, 25, Bob in 10 different formations. Then again, in 10 different, you know, and I, it's kind of, that's how I learned. And coach White would come and sit with me um, every other day and go over this, you know, the landmark and, and what I should look for. And we'll, what would happen if this guy blitzed or this guy or this guy, and if the, the line did this. And so, so he was really there every second. And then when you got on the field and you were killing people, like I remember in spring ball, I was bringing it. You can ask BJ Tucker. That dude went up in the air. He was like flying and coach white was running over high fiving me, slapping me in the ass, you know, like getting really excited. And that was, you know, that, that was great. It was like, it all came to, uh, you know, the forefront of just how great of a coach he was and how much he would not sugarcoat. Like he was basically like six months before that. He's like, Bernie, you suck, dude. And I was like, yeah, coach, you're right. I don't know what I'm doing out here. Um, and then to work with me and then to bring it all to me, blowing people up in spring uh, was, was special. So I think coach Alvarez brought that dynamic and he let his guys really run with it. 
um, and he trusted them. And I think that's what a good general does. He gets the right coaches, gets the right, you know, guys to lead. And then he, he's able to recruit some of the most special, you know, obviously look at running backs and linemen and, and really put up what a wall around Wisconsin. It's, it's, it's special. Wisconsin is one of those programs that's kind of known for developing players uh, and, you know, kind of almost legendary for developing walk-on players. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, do you really see that the success Wisconsin's had as kind of being a, a byproduct of that framework that you were just talking about? You know, I think it stems from a lot of different things. I, I, I one, I think, um, I think the, the assistant coaches and coach Alvarez have an eye for good talent. Um, I think they're lucky. I think Wisconsin's a good state for football where, you know, a guy like Jimmy Leonard is in state. What happens if he was in California? You know, I don't think they're getting, they're going to go look at Jimmy Leonard. Um, I think, I think there's been some luck in that way, but you know, when you have guys in state, like a, like a Zach Hampton, like a Jimmy Leonard, I mean, JJ Watt was a walk on, although he went to Eastern Michigan, you know, like you have great, great players. You have great talent from Wisconsin. And you know what? You can bring guys in and take a chance on a five, six, you know, what, 160 pound dude like Jimmy Leonard, take a chance on him. You know, all he needs is two plays. You know, he's the first play is like, nah, that he'll never do that again. And the second play, he does it again. You're like, okay, he's a starter now. And, and that's how special some of those guys are who come in and, and, you know, like Ben Strickland, same, same type of guy. Like, you know, these guys work their butts off to be on the team because they're from Wisconsin. They've watched it. They love it. I'm not saying it means more to, to them than it did to me, but it's, I think it's more special for them being from Wisconsin. And I, and I do think that the coaches will coach you no matter what, you know, if you're a walk on or you're a scholarship, at least back in the day, they were, they did not care. You know, it's uh, they, they, they really coached hard no matter who it was. And I think it's special. The tradition of having walk ons, basically go play in the NFL is, is extremely special. And, and it's not everywhere else that that's happening. So for people who don't remember your playing days, your, your glory days back in uh, the early 2000s, uh, tell me a little bit about your game. What were some of your primary tools? What were you kind of known for on the team? <laughs> primary tools? I think that uh, I, I, I think I was crazy. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot of it stems from like a little bit of like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, my coaches knew that I would say when I was on the football field, I was probably one of the most crazier people, not in like jumping around and punching people and doing anything like that. More of like the fact that you're running full speed into another person who weighs probably close to the same amount of weight, but you're doing it. It's like, in, it's insanity, right? You're doing the same thing over and over and over. And I think, uh, my coaches knew like when they would piss me off, I would start crushing people and, and it happened a bunch of times at practice. Um, I mean, it, it, so I think there's, you know, you have to be a little bit of crazy to play football at, at, in the big 10 or in college. Um, I would say my football IQ was, was really high. Uh, when, you know, I picked up things once I started working with coach white outside of, you know, after the first season, when I redshirted, it all kind of started clicking. You know, we watched the same film. We would talk about plays. We talk about what guys were doing. I could probably at the end of my career drop every single play, not the pass routes. Cause I didn't, you know, who cares what the outside guys are doing, but I knew what most of them were doing, you know, and, and, um, you know, I knew how to pick up the pass uh, protection. So I would say my football IQ and just my little bit of crazy to just run downhill and, and really just not care about my body or my brain, just uh, straight downhill and blow people up was was uh was was definitely uh something that the coaches really enjoyed you know it's funny we we played uh, at arizona we did a power i ear hold this guy he went he went limp he was went down he got up after like two seconds and i just stood there like i basically just won you know the lottery i was so happy and i'm walking by the offensive line coach room uh, and Coach Huber, who was notoriously kind of an ass, he's like, Bernie, get in here. And I'm like, oh, man, what, I miss a block? Comes in, he's like, hey, everyone, watch this block. And he, I, you know, the guy goes limp. He's like, Bernie, do that every time. You play in the NFL forever. He's like, that's what I like. That's what I want to see. He's like, every one of you guys should be knocking dudes out like Bernie. 
And I walked out, I was like, wow, a compliment. This is great. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of that. There was a, a lot of, uh, I don't know. I, I think I just, I, you know, another thing, I, I just think I really enjoyed it. I, I really like bought into the fun of football and, you know, like practice sucks and working out some of those stadiums sucks. But it's fun to be with your guys and it's fun to joke around and, and, you know, BS. And when you're dying, it's fun to smile and say, this sucks. And, uh, you know, I, I have a funny story. Uh, talk about a little bit of crazy. I, we did a counter play and I didn't see Alex Lewis, who was a badass around the corner, knock my helmet clear off. It, and, it, you know, the chin strap is buckled on. It didn't unbuckle. It ripped the chin strap. So the chin strap was still buckled in four places, but it ripped it off completely. Helmet flew up in the air, mouthpiece on the ground. And I jogged off the field and Coach White goes, hey, Bernie, Bernie, come over here. And I jogged over. I'm like, what's up, Coach? And he's like, where's your helmet? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, where's your helmet? And I'm, you know, start touching my head. I'm like, oh, I'm like, Coach, I don't know. Where's my helmet? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, Bert, he's like, trainer, we got a problem. You know, and it, I, you know, I had to find my helmet. It was ripped. They, they're like, I'm, the trainer's like, I've never seen this before in our, in forever. So, uh, so, you know, I take pride in some of that stuff. Uh, you know, never, I would get blown up or I'd blow people up and I would always go back and do it again. I used to tell guys, linebackers who were fired up, oh, oh, Bernie, just got the best of you. I'd be like, you won't be here in the fourth quarter. I will be here in the fourth quarter. Uh, so, so there's a little, a little bit of that edge. Um, but once, once again, you know, like you'll never feel that again. Like I'll never feel that crazy about running out of Camp Randall all pumped up. Like that'll never happen again. So there's some years have passed between your playing days and now, and I'm wondering if there are any uh, moments that you look back on now that you think, well, I was like legitimately insane for the way I played or what I did there. Uh, mo most of the moments that I thought I was legitimately insane were at the bar. <laughs> uh, or, or more around Madison. Um, but in a football game, you know, once uh, we were, we were playing Ohio state in 03, my brother came up, you know, you'd walk through the stands. My brother came out of nowhere. He, he went to Wisconsin also. He's a year behind me. And I don't remember this. And I, I don't think it happened on purpose, but I, but my helmet hit his head. I'm not sure if I head butted him or we were so fired up and he got a cut over his eye and he's, he was all bad at me, but I thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> You know, like sometimes you'd be walking through Camp Randall and like a Michigan fan or some other team's fan would come up and, you know, they'd be too close to you and you just kind of push them out of your way, which is funny because no one else, cared. people love that. Like the fans loved it. I, I mean, now looking back, I think that's kind of rude. But at the time when I was 20 years old and Wisconsin football was all that mattered, that's all that mattered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me think. Anything crazy. There's some things I really can't tell. Um, <laughs> there's some things I can't tell. There, are, you know, it's just uh, before Iowa in 2002, I was a little sick. I took like 25 different pills to try to make up for it. And during warmups, I threw up on the field. And Coach White just looks at me and goes, Bernie, are you not ready for this game? And I was like, <laughs> I just threw up, coach. Is that not okay? <laughs> you know, it's like those funny things that you remember. Uh, but there's, yeah, a lot of, God, I'm thinking back to all the, the great football games and all the, all the fun we had. And really, you know, if you win a football game and you went to Wando's or the KK, you were, you couldn't, there was nothing that you couldn't do. And this is back in the day. So, uh, <laughs> oh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Too much fun. <laughs> so we got to talk about the Yom Kippur game, which is back in 2004. I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and before we get into talking about the mm -hmm. game a little bit, uh, we got to talk about Yom Kippur for the, the non-Jews out there, uh, why it's significant. <laughs> uh, just uh, kind of explain what the day is and, and you know why it's important to the Jewish people. Uh, Yom Kippur is, is basically like uh, the Day of Atonement. You, you fast for your sins that you've had over the year. Um, it's one of the most holy days. It is the most holy day um, for the Jewish people. You know, you, it's right after the new year. It, it's just like a, a, a very serious day. Um, and, you know, usually you spend it in temple. You don't, you don't eat, you fast, you don't drink any water for 24 hours. I mean, you don't, 
yeah, now you're not really supposed to be on electronics, you're not supposed to watch the TV. You know, for me, I watch TV and I, but I don't eat or drink water. It's just a, it's just like a really serious day. Uh, you know, so to get into the question in 2004, in the summer, I looked at the schedule. I was like, dad, we are in trouble. My dad's like, yeah, you got Penn State at 11 o'clock in the morning on Yom Kippur. I'm like, dad, you know, like, and, and, and listen, I, I'm not a super Jewish. I, I'm not, uh, you know, Hasidic or conservative. I'm more reformed. I, I like the traditions of the holidays. I think it's important to to keep those traditions and those values. Um, but I don't go to temple all the time, you know, like, but some of the major holidays, um, I'm very serious. But, you know, it's like if you don't eat meat on Fridays for um, what? Lent. What is the, for Lent, yes, sorry. So, you know, like I would, I would do that, you know, I, I, I would like if that's, that would be something I would do, you know, it's like tradition. It's, it's something. So on Yom Kippur, you don't eat or drink. Um, and what was good is we went three and oh at a conference and game day came and said, Hey, we're going to switch the game to four forty five. I was like, Oh, thank God. I was like, man, this is great. You know, and you're also not supposed to thank God. So I was like, now I got to atone for that too. <laughs> so, um, so luckily, you know, 445 game gave me, I told, so coach Alvarez so talking about pr- previously, you know, how great of a coach he was. I go, coach, listen, we got an issue. Yom Kippur, the holiest day falls on game day. Penn State. He goes, Bernie, whatever you need, let me know and we'll make it happen. And to me, that's super special because now I felt really confident. You know, I was the only Jewish guy on the team. So for me, it was, it was, hey, listen, I, I can't warm up. So I think at four o'clock, I said, coach, I have to be eating at four o'clock. I have to end by 4.30. So I have to be wherever. So I was eating by myself at four o'clock dinner, eat, drinking water in a hotel by myself, buffet style, just crushing it. And then I couldn't <laughs> do any of the night. Um, you know, like usually you'd go to like, a, at, at least we used to go to a movie. It was actually really fun. We used to go to a movie um, down at Point Cinema um, as a team. I used to love doing that, but I couldn't go to that. I sat in the hotel room. The next day I told Coach, I was like, listen, I got to go to, I got to go to um, the Hillel to go to services. My family was there. Alex was there. Um, We went to services. It was, what was so cool about it is you have the opportunity to get bought up on, 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 it's not really a stage, but to the front and I held the tour. The tour weighs a lot of, you know, it's, it's heavy. I held the tour up and my brother was able to kind of undress it. it. It's like a scroll. So it has like a, a jacket on it. So he took it off. You know, I held it, I held it up. So it was like a special day within the, within the holiday. And then they picked me up, brought me back to the stadium. I didn't warm up with anybody. You know, I'm sitting in the, in the locker room by myself while everyone's warming up. Uh, and I basically broke the fast on kickoff at 4:45. So I did the 24 hours. I felt good about. I mean, I felt good about doing that. I got two IVs actually while people were warming up, so I was, you know, for safety. Um, but it was the first half was just a nightmare for me. You know, like when you don't eat food and you play in a full football game, it, it was it was pretty pretty torturous. But Alvi, you know, Coach Alvarez had turkey and oranges on the sideline waiting. Um, you know, they were, you know, constantly watching to make sure I was okay. We went in at halftime. We were, I think it was like six to three. It was a terrible game. We couldn't move the ball. Uh, I remember Rasmus James knocked out like three of their quarterbacks. Their guy Robinson, he, he knocked him. So he knocked him out. His mom was like trying to get him arrested. That's how bad he crushed them. And then we went, you know, we went into halftime and, that this is when um, Dwayne Smith had his heart problem the year before AD was hurt. Anthony Davis was hurt. Um, Booker Stanley just, I guess he wasn't just caught in there. Something was wrong. And Jameel Walker was a freshman and he had a fumble. And so coach, coach white came in. He's like, listen, Bernie, you know, and I, I would take reps at halfback, maybe one or two, but you kind of learn it from osmosis listening to this is my retro junior year. It's my fourth year. I've listened to coach white drill the, the rules into the running back's heads. So I felt comfortable. Like I would take some snaps with guys, I, you know, I didn't do many, but I would take them. And coach Rice like, dude, you're in. And I'm like, coach, I'm in, man. I'm in a fullback. I'm dying right now. And he's like, no, 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 you're in at 
halfback. And I was like, I just walked up to Greg Root, who is the backup fullback. And I'm like, yo, Greg, let's, it's our time, dude. Let's do this. <laughs> I changed my shoes into my faster shoes, which didn't really do anything. <laughs> they just, I just felt faster, you know, ment- <laughs> mental. And, uh, and uh, you know, the O-line, I, I ran into the huddle. And, and the O-line, you're talking about these dudes were. You had Joe Thomas, you had Dan Benning, Donovan Rayola, Jonathan Klinkscale, and I think Morgan Davis or Mike Lorenz. Maybe it was Mike Lorenz. And these dudes were bad. You know, Dan Benning, Donovan Rayola. Donovan Rayola was one of the baddest dudes I've ever played with. Um, not in like a, like a dirty way, in like a just wanted to hurt you legally way. Uh, Klinkscale, was, Klinkscale was one of my favorite individuals. I'd be in a bar with that dude, and he would not let somebody screw with you. He never really talked, but he would never let anyone mess with you. Um, and then you had Joe Thomas. Which we ran to his side every play. He's the best lineman probably ever to pretty much go to school there. Um, you know, and then, and then in the, because of those dudes and because Greg Root picked up blitzes and, and block dudes, you know, I, I rushed for 123 yards in the second half. And the one play I got yelled at for should have been a touchdown. And I messed it up. And every time I watch it, I cringe at how bad my read was. I could have walked in to the end zone in front of the students and, and, and being my crazy, I would have thrown the football in the stands. I would have went bananas and I would have gotten a penalty. So I'm not sure if it's a bad thing that that didn't happen. Um, but actually it's funny. Clint scale came up to me and he goes, Bernie, follow me the, all day. Follow me. And if you watch, if you go back and watch, if anyone actually has that film, it's very grainy because it's on a VHS. Um, you can watch Clint scale lighting people up, you know, and that's how special the team was then. You know, these guys, and not saying it's not now, but these guys, you know, when times were tough, these dudes, we, you know, we had each other's backs and everyone, those, the linemen and Greg Root stepped up so phenomenally, like even Darren Charles, who looked like, um, like one of those, those stick bugs, you know, he was like 6'11", 140 pounds, was blocking downfield. So, you know, it, 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 everyone took it upon themselves to really step up and, uh, you know, to win at game day was was really special. I got to drink beers with Fowler and uh, Aaron Andrews and Herb Street at Wando's that night. So uh, that's an experience. You know, my dad and Fowler are like best friends by the end of the night. Super weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, if you want to ask, my dad became like a mythical creature. He had like Brent Musburger was like, mentioned my parents at the Ohio State game in 2004. He's like, oh, I was just outside with the Birdstein family. They're such nice people. Like a, and I'm like, that never happens on TV, <laughs> you know, like his, um, but that's, you know, like we all, all of us from New York, really, my family, especially bought in a hundred percent to how awesome Wisconsin was. My dad was drinking beers with Wisconsin, you know, my, my best friend, Michael Kleber, his dad and his mom, they were drinking beers after beers. Um, we just had, you know, over the course of five or six years, do you remember Pizzeria Uno that was on state street? Yep. So that place is, you know, it's Pizzeria Uno. It's nothing special. We would go in there with like 20 people and they'd be like, uh, no, nah, well, I don't know if we could do that. And I was like, guys, we got 20 people. Five of us just played football in the game. They're like, okay, okay, okay. And they would put tables together and we would do, there was anywhere from like 10 to 25 people at any given time at any home game. And we would get pitchers and chug and pass completely disgusting <laughs> but i'm talking about like moms would chug and pass you know dads grandparents it was such a comical thing to see and we basically like took over unos on state street and then we just chug beer in front of everybody and and it was great like you know the guys what i always thought was special is if you're just nice to people in wisconsin they'll be nice to you so the manager would be like, hey, Bernstein, what's up, buddy? Nice to see you. And I'd be like, hey, we're back. You got a table? He's like, got your table. I do you beer. That to me was, I've never seen some moms chug beer. And it was <laughs> great. <laughs> I've still never seen my mom chug beer. And I, I'm waiting. It's been 36 years. I'll get her. But, <laughs> you know, like the, the waiter would come over and be like, hey, uh, you finished that picture. You want another one? We'd be like, yeah, we'll take two more. <laughs> And then we would just keep turning. Our, it's so weird, but it was so great, though. 
So it must have been just a really cool experience for like the offensive line. They must have just loved the fact that the, they were blocking for you that day. And it must have been really cool for you uh, just to kind of have everybody kind of rally around you and uh, and help uh, help you out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty special when you're an old line and you have a 265 pounds, uh, you know, like fat running back. <laughs> fullback running for 120. I mean, that just shows how good you are. And that Penn State defense was good. They had Puzz Lovesny. They had some really good dudes on that team. And 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 the line, and the I would say from for everybody just blocked. It, it it was just like everyone took a step up and was like, hey, we're gonna make sure everyone's covered. And uh, yeah, it was. I mean, it was Coach Alvarez was smiling on the side. You never see that dude smile. He never. If you're up by 500 points. He'll still be mad at like the three plays you messed up. That dude was smiling at on the, you know, after the first run, they, they panned to him and he's smiling. And I, I think it's almost like a, Hey, hey Joe Pa in your face. Like we can do this with a fat New York Jewish guy playing fullback. <laughs> um, but, but you know what? We, we loved it. You know, like those dudes, the wide receivers, I mean, I'm talking about these guys are blocking downfield and they were, and they, it just, you know, like Greg Ruth played very seldomly, but when he played, it was special, you know, was, and, and he took, he took his role and he, he really ran with it. And, and not many guys do that. You know, not many guys are, are the, the number two for their whole career. And, and when they get in, they, they take it upon themselves to produce like that. And, and it's just, I thought it was just so special. And, and to watch, you know, to have Clint scale come up and say, you'll follow me. I mean, how many people actually do that? Like that was real. And uh, it's only in movies you see this corny stuff happen, but he 100%, he came up, You, if you watch the game, I made one bad read, he blew this dude up, I went the other way, I got tackled. And he comes over and he goes, Bernie, what the hell? You know, you could see him, like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, you're right, man, I should follow you. You're right. And he was, you know, he, he's a funny dude. But I think from the, you know, Coach White was pumped. You know, even Anthony Davis was fired up. And, and it's just nice to have that. You know, like, and somebody asked me after the game, he's like, you know, are you pumped to be playing tailback any, you know, for the next few games? I was like, listen, <laughs> my role is to block for Anthony Davis. <laughs> that dude is an all American. I am not an all American. I had a good game. Let's, let's let, please. I'm like, AD, please come back. And, and, you know, like AD would come back. He came back against Penn state and I mean, against Ohio state and he won us that game, you know? And, and, uh, and I played like, I would probably say I played maybe 10 snaps at tailback. You know, I had, a, I had a few good runs, but I'm not someone who would win us the game. Anthony Davis was somebody who could take a play that was a nightmare and score a touchdown. Like a Jonathan Taylor, right? Like who's, he's, he, oh, everyone's like, oh, he's going to be tackled. And then all of a sudden he's through the line. And Anthony Davis was like that. Me, I can't fit through the line. So <laughs> we're, we're just going to fall down and be done to the next play. But uh, yeah, dude, those, those guys are no joke. Uh, did you have any good moments or good exchanges with uh, Barry Alvarez uh, during that game or after the game? I mean, I, he gave me the game ball. I still have it. It's, it, it I mean, I, you know, it's super special. It's, it's, it's so funny. It's so cool. Um, you, you know, he was, he was fired up. You know, it, it's not every day that somebody kind of goes out of position to do something special, which I thought everybody on that field, even the, I mean, look at the defense let up what I think 10 points in the whole game three until like the fourth quarter. So, I mean, it wasn't just one person. It was every single person kind of stepped up. So it was a great team win. Um, but yeah, coach Albie and coach white was fired up. You know, it's, it's great to make Albie smile, you know, like that's, kinda, <laughs> that's kind of like, it's like making your wife or your, you know, your fiance smile. It's, uh, it's hard to do and but it's great when it happens. <laughs> right, babe. <laughs> so tell me about the the post game fun a little bit more. Uh, what did you do to celebrate? What was kind of the the aftermath of that game? So we 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 had a rule uh, through the team. You really couldn't go out any other day but Saturday night. Sundays you could. You, there was no, Sundays there was no curfew, but on Monday at like five at six o'clock a.m. I worked out. So what am I going to do on Sunday night? So Saturday was the only time we could go out, and I was fired up right away. You know, and I, you, you shower and you go meet, uh, my parents were there. Um, you know, once again, my brother was there and we just, you know, you hit the town. We went to Wando's and that was when we went upstairs 
floors. Now it's three floors. The second floor, and it was it was it was crazy. It was, you know, Jay Wando brought us up there, and he's like, "Hey, this is Fowler, Herb Street, Aaron Andrews," and I was just like, "Holy moly, Aaron Andrews!" I was like, "How? What?" You're like, "What do you say, Aaron?" I'm like, "Can I have seven cores lights?" I'm like, Aaron, I let me talk to you in five minutes from here. Um, but it was really fun to see, like, you know, to, to be around Fowler. And Fowler is such a guy's guy. So is Herb Street. Um, it, it's just like my dad and Fowler legitimately talked for 25 minutes, and they were just hanging. You know, it's 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 fun to see those guys not in in uh, their roles, kind of, you know, so to say. And it was it was special. They're like, wow, what a good game, man. How how you feel? You know, it was, it was fun to just converse with them. And, you know, after like a few too many, I was off to the KK and I left them there, which is fine. What's funny is my dad saw a Corso in the airport the next day. And he, my dad like never cared about going up to say hi to somebody. Went up to Corso and say, hey, hey, Mr. Corso, you know, my son's Matt Bernstein. He goes, oh, that guy had a great game yesterday. And they talked like a half an hour at the airport. And I was like, dad, what? And he's like, yeah, we just had this beautiful conversation. <laughs> so it was just really funny. but. I'll tell you what, and those guys, at, at least Herb Street, he could party. Uh, I don't know if he can't do it anymore, I'm, I'm assuming, but it, it was, uh, it, it was, a, it was a, you know, when did a New Yorker who played football at such a small school think he'd be drinking beers with Fowler and Herb Street and Aaron Andrews after a Big Ten, you know, win, game day win, you know, and, and I will, I'll pump myself up. I was a game day player of the game which is on my resume, by the way. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so that's my one, that's kind of my favorite, but uh, you know, it, it, it was special. And, and my dad, for my dad, it was more special. Like he's never been so happy. So it was a pretty memorable game. I think a lot of people probably, if they were fans at the time, uh, they would probably remember that, uh, that game. Um do you have, does it ever come up in interesting moments uh, for you? Have you ever had kind of just like crazy circumstances with somebody on the streets just like, hey, I, I remember that game? Mm, that's a great question, too. Mm, that's really, I, I want to say, you know, I don't, I don't, it's, it's just, it happens. It's obviously as we get older, it happens less frequently. Um, but it's happened in a bunch of places, which has been really cool. I, I walked into a bar in 2006 on the Upper East Side, which is now like the Badger Bar for games. And they had, a, they had the poster up. And I was just like, that's me. Like, how the hell did I get up here? I'm like, this is great. <laughs> and then, um, I'm trying to think. I want to say, like, some crazy things have happened. Like, when I've been – I used to work for the foundation in, in Wisconsin and for the university. And I want to say, like, crazy things used to happen – when like, it would be like me and my boss would be walking around and like either people I was friends with or some friends would be like, Hey, Bernstein. And I'd be like, Oh boy, here we go. This is, this is great. You know, for me, I, I loved it. I think he loved it, but it was, you know, it's kind of a little awkward, but I, yeah, I can't remember anything specific, at least right now that was so out of, you know, it's always nice. Like I saw some dude, um, I was coming back. We spent Christmas with, um, Allie's, my fiance's family in Verona. And I was coming back on the airport and the city attorney, he's like, Hey, Ber you're Bernstein, right? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'm going to the game. You're going to be there. I'm like, yeah. He's like, send me a text. So I'm, I'm texting the city attorney of Madison to come to Mad River so we could drink beers together, which we did. And then we went to the, you know, it, I think that's special, right? New York city, you're not meeting the city attorney to drink beers to go to the Badger game. And I think, I, you know, to go back to like way back at the beginning of our chat, that's what's so special about Wisconsin and, and the pride that people have for, their, for the state and then people have for the alumni, even in New York. It, it, that is so special to me. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. So what are you up to these days? I know you live out in New York now. Uh, what are you doing? So these days I am, I live on the Upper West Side with my beautiful fiance. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I work for a university in Israel, uh, fundraising, which is super cool. What they do is, when I say that if I had 25 brains of my own brain, I still wouldn't have one of theirs. I mean, they, 
they are solving world problems that I can't even comprehend. There's, I, it's called the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. It's basically the MIT of Israel. Um, I was actually, we talked, I was just there. They are doing, some of the coolest things I think they're doing is they are doing stuff with um, fake meat that is 3D printed. So like vegan meat, 3D printed. Who on earth comes up with that idea? They do. Um, they are doing test tube meat. So instead of like cows getting slaughtered, which is also their cows are like the, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, but they're really bad for the environment. Test tube, test tube meat. Who would, who would have thought like that? And then my favorite, cause I'm a huge falafel guy, algae falafel, which is supposed to be super nutritious for you and tastes delicious. I, I don't, I don't even know. And, and I guess I, I, I obviously swing towards the food cause I'm a fat dude. So I love the food aspect of what they're doing, but they are really trying to help the world. Cause in 30 years, I hate to tell you this. <laughs> I, I read a statistic today, 58, it's either 58 or 59 billion animals are killed a year. So we can eat them. That's a lot of animals. I, I, I have to agree. Like that's a lot of animals. So if we could do test tube meat instead of killing a, a billion cows or 58 billion of them, uh, I think that's smart. And I don't think the world can sustain the meat demand. Um, so they're really doing some bananas things. If you have kids, I don't know, Craig, do you have kids? No, I don't. Okay. So eventually, hopefully, hopefully I will too. They are, so antibiotics are actually too commonly prescribed. So people in like 30 years will be, um, they won't work anymore. They'll have, uh, they, they just won't work. So there's a company of Technion alumni who created a blood test. And it's a quick and easy, less than 15 minutes to tell you if you have a viral infection or a bacterial infection. Because a viral infection, you don't need antibiotics. So I'm sorry to get into like the technical, but they're doing very cool things like that. I can talk forever about the technology. It's it's just listen. I don't do research on anything, and Allie will tell you I can't even research bands for the wedding. But these guys do research for days upon days, and they crush it. And I can't wait to try an algae falafel. <laughs> <laughs> so, how often do you make it back to uh, Madison? Uh, I go back to Madison probably like three or four times a year. Um, I would, I would love to go back 500 times a year if I could. I, Madison, I would say I have uh, a few favorite places in my life, and Madison is definitely top, probably top three, if not top two. <laughs> I don't even know if there's – Madison might be my favorite place. So say you only have three hours uh, to spend in Madison. You got a layover or something like that. Uh, what do you do? Oh, I love this question. Three hours in Madison. Okay, so I'm running to Tornado Room. I'm getting a 14-ounce filet, rare. I am also getting steak fries on the side. I'm going to eat that as fast as I can with a bottle of red Chianti, to be exact. That place is my favorite restaurant. Then I am sprinting down State Street. Probably not sprinting because I just ate 14-ounce filet. It would be <laughs> bad if I was sprinting. I am going to Wando's. And then I'm just going to sit there until I need to go <laughs> and just <laughs> drink, uh, drink beers with all those guys who are, you know, some of my, my very good friends for years either manage Wando's or um, they work in some role there. And, and it's just, to me, that's where I met my fiance. Like that place has, I worked there as a, as a student. Jay, who owns it, has been, him and my dad have like this relationship. It's, it's a little awkward. They are, they love each other so much that, my dad, one time I went into the bar, Jay was outside. I was in there for like two hours. I'm like, where the hell is my dad at? And I went back outside. They're having a conversation, two hours. And I'm like, Jay, let him go, man. I can drink some beers with this guy. Uh, so I think that's what I would do. But, you know, the union, uh, there's, there's so many good spots. Uh, brats. Oh, man. <laughs> ah, I love that place. I, I can go. I can go for days about what I would want to do, but mostly I would eat Tornado Room and then go to Wando's. <laughs> I love that you met your fiance at Wando's. Yeah, I knew Wando's would come through. <laughs> <laughs> 
So before we finish up, we got to talk about your podcast a little bit. Uh, you've done a lot of uh, local radio, and uh, you've been doing this podcast uh, for, I think, the last two years. Uh, it's been about two years. I've been on the radio with them for probably like over two years, but we did the podcast with uh, it's with Zach Halperin, who is uh, one of my favorite dudes. Like he just tells it how it is. Um, he's he is a straight shooter. Um, and I love it. Like we, we went to uh, Chicago for the um, big 10 media days. And he, he just asked, he was asking some hard questions to some of the captains and <laughs> I was dying laughing. I was like, Oh my God, did he just say, it? he's like, he asked uh, one of the Minnesota guys, like, listen, you guys have had no success. How do you think you could possibly have some? And this dude like <laughs> looked at him. I was like, yes, Zach, you're the best. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's fun. We talk Wisconsin football. We talk stupid stories, kind of some of the stuff we talked about. Um, we've had some, you know, we've, we've had like Jeff Mack, who's a linebacker on, John Stocko. You know, sometimes we have some guest appearances, but it's really just kind of like, it, it's it's fun football. And, you know, my insights into what's going on in the season are nothing special, but it's it's just fun to talk about the Badgers. Yeah, it must be nice to be kind of stay connected uh, with the football program in some sense, uh, uh, by just kind of talking about it and being involved. Yeah, it's 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 real. It's it's really nice to stay connected. I know, um, you know, a bunch of us do something with the zone uh, in some way. I know I got Anthony Davis on the roundtable, so it's it's nice. You know, you talk to old guys about what they're seeing now, and and uh, I think we might have stupid insights, but we have some intelligent insights. So I, I think it's worthwhile to listen to. That's called the camp. But uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to hear a lot of stupid stories and you're going to hear me say a lot of stupid things, but that's what's great about, I got a face for radio, you know? So it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you to Matt Bernstein. That was really cool. I uh, hope I get a chance to have a drink with him at Wando's at some point. That'd be really cool. Make sure to check out his podcast, The Camp. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wisconsin Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. You can also stay in the loop about the pod by visiting wispod.com or checking us out on Twitter and Facebook. Cheers. Cheers.